Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Australian National University and to the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies. I'd first like to recognise the Indigenous people of this region, the Ngunnawal people, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to recognise and welcome especially the ambassadors of Ecuador, Argentina, Mexico, Venezuela, Peru, El Salvador, Chile, Uruguay, and Ethiopia. And I apologise if I've missed anyone in this <laughs> fairly large crowd. Colombia. And Colombia. <laughs> Colombia. Every time I do that, I miss <laughs> it. It's, it's a disaster for protocol. <laughs> Ecuador, uh, they are a relatively small country of 15 or 16 million people, has been the focus of a great deal of international discussion since the presidency of President Rafael Correa. Because of a variety of transformations and attempted transformations that have happened in this country, transformations which I think have implications well beyond the borders of Ecuador itself. The plan for Buen Vivir, Good Living, has suggested an entirely different development model to that taking place in most of the developing world. The Citizens Revolution has suggested a new political and socio-economic project leading to a plurinational and intercultural state. Tonight, we are privileged to have with us to trace these developments, Ambassador Leonardo Arizaga. He will present the historic transformation that Ecuador is undergoing and explain how these major revolutions are being pursued in the face of very great ongoing challenges facing that country. The Ambassador is presently the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador. He has been, been awarded a variety of degrees from the United States and had academic training in Ecuador, Chile, the UK, and he holds a doctorate from the Central University of Ecuador. Since he began his career as a diplomat in 1987, he's had many different positions in bilateral and multilateral affairs within the Ministry of Foreign Relations of his country, being Secretary for Bilateral Relations from 2009 to 2010. He has served as a diplomat in Austria, Slovakia and Peru, Deputy Representative to the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the International Atomic Energy Association and the United Nations Office in Vienna. He has been Ambassador to China and to Venezuela and he is currently Vice-Chancellor of Foreign Affairs. At the conclusion of his talk, there'll be time for questions and discussion and light refreshments provided by our partners this evening, who I'd like to, well, to thank very much for that, the, Ambassador, the Embassy of Ecuador. Please welcome with me, Ambassador Arisica. Buenas noches. <clears throat> que, que gusto estar en Australia. <laughs> How are you? It's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to start off uh, with a greeting from my president, Rafael Correa, my foreign minister, and the citizen revolution that we're living in Ecuador. Uh, an honor to be in such a prestigious university, one of the best in the world, I'm told with excellent staff and an increasing number of Latin American students and some of them from Ecuador. And we will tell you a little bit about the, the revolution we're living in our educational system, the transformation that are taking place and how we have been able to change the life of our people, the structure of our state, and the welfare of most of the citizens that live in Ecuador. I don't know how I changed the... Okay. He's my president. He's uh, won uh, nine elections over the last eight years. And he will finish his term of office in two years. And, and the good thing about our government has been that the longer we are in power, the higher the acceptance rate of our people is, which usually doesn't take place because the longer you're in power, 
the lower your approval rating is. And this is because we've been able to, to do many things in a very short period of time that has helped us uh, change the quality of life of our people. The first thing we did is we were able to renegotiate our foreign debt. Eight billion dollars we saved with this renegotiation. <coughs> we changed the content and the format of our oil contracts. Now, main, the most important part of, our, of the profits stay in Ecuador. They don't go abroad. We have been able to invest in the social debt we have as a country. In the last 10 to 15 years, a large amount of our budget went to foreign debt. We paid $2 billion in foreign debt and $2 billion in social investment. Due to the policies we have had in, in foreign debt management, in um, tax revenue, basically what I want to tell you is that now the, mo the largest part of our budget is spent on our people, not on foreign debt. We pay our obligations, we always do. We comply with our word but we're able to spend in projects in, 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 in high schools, in the health sector, in infrastructure, in a very significant way. So instead of spending $2 billion a year in our social area, we spent $10 billion, five times more. So the main result of these policies has been that we were able to reduce poverty in a very significant way. Eight years ago, one out of three Ecuadorian was poor. Still, today, one out of five is poor. But we were able to get 1.5 million people out of poverty in eight years. This is the most important achievement when you can uh, remove 10% of your population from poverty. The other thing we have done is to reduce inequality. Latin America is the most unequal region in the world, unfortunately. Eight years ago, the 10% of the population, the richest 10% of the population, earned 40 times more than the 10% poorest part of our population. After eight years, the difference is half. The 10% richest only earn, only, earn 20 times more than the 10% poorest. And this is because we have done a lot of things I will mention. We have improved statistics and malnutrition. And we have done something which is extremely important in higher education and education. In our high schools, Eight years ago, there was no public high school with international baccalaureate, not one. When I gave a speech in the General Assembly last year in September, we had 80 schools with IBs. Today, we have 150 high schools with international baccalaureate. And in 2017, we will have 500. In the last couple of years, we have hired 12,000 new teachers for our high schools. We have removed ideology from our high school education. In Ecuador and in many countries of our region, the, the teachers' union 
was controlled by the Communist Party. Now, our teachers are selected based on their merit, not their ideology. We are building 900 new schools. Until next year, we will have built 300 new schools with the latest technology, infrastructure, and internet access. All of this has allowed us that in the last two years, 200,000 students have moved from private schools to public schools. 20% of our students decided to leave private schools to go to public schools. When you are able to change your educational system so that fiscal schools, public schools that are for free are better than your private schools, you have reached an important milestone. In addition to that, we have changed our university system. We closed 14 universities with 60,000 students because they had a low academic level. For the first time in our history, you have to take an entrance exam to enter a university. And we have created new high standard universities in our country. In addition to that, we're sending at this present mo time, we have 10,500 students abroad getting their master's and PhD degree. Before this government, there were 200. Now there are 10,500. Out of these, 600, up to 600 and 700, are getting their master's and PhD in Australia. I was proud of that until yesterday when I was in Melbourne and I met 300 of my students there and they told me that in Melbourne and in Victoria there are 175,000 foreign students. So 300 is not a lot. <laughs> but for us, 10,500 students getting their masters and PhD is extremely important. In Ecuador, any student who is accepted in the 200 best universities in the world, like this one, automatically the state will pay his tuition and his education. This is what I told you, how in the last two years, 200,000 students have moved from private to public schools. The other thing we're doing is we're bringing to Ecuador the best professors and researchers in the world. We are, have right now 300 professors and researchers in Ecuador, and we will increase that number to 900 in the next couple of years. And we pay them everything. Their air ticket, a good salary, $6,000, health and life insurance. And the only thing they have to do is to share their knowledge. Unfortunately, only six Australians are there now, and we want them to come in, 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 in a larger number. We want to have 60 Australian professors and researchers, not six. And, to, and they work in different universities, basically in hard sciences, with our staff and our people. In addition to that, we have English teachers that don't speak English. <laughs> so we have decided to send them abroad. 5,000 high school teachers from six months to a year to learn and to improve their English. 
Last year, we sent 1,000 teachers to the United States. Today, we signed an agreement with St. Vincent and the Grenadines, an island in the Caribbean. We're sending 50. The only thing we ask of them is that when they finish their education, they go back home and teach in our public schools. And they have to do it for a couple of years, at least. So now we have English teachers that speak English. The other thing we have done in the social field is to transform the life of our disabled people. For two years, we visited all of them in the 24 provinces to see their needs, to know what the family was living like and what they needed, and to have a register of, of the technical implements they needed. And after that, we gave them all the equipment they needed, and we included most of them into the labor force. By law in Ecuador, every public and private enterprise has to hire 4% of its staff from the disabled people. So now, the quality of life of our people that have a disability has changed radically. And in some cases, they cannot work because they have such a bad disability or advanced disability. In those cases, we pay a family member to take care of that person. Because what usually happens is that a family member, a poor family, has a family member that goes out to work to take care of that per person that is disabled. So we prefer to pay a family member who will take care of that person with affection, <coughs> with love, for the time that is needed. This uh, has changed the life of a huge part of our community. And the vice president who did this left office after six years, and he had an approval rating of 98%, and a poll that had a margin of error of 4%. When a politician leaves government, with 98 approval rating, that in theory could be 102% approval rating, <laughs> you know that we did something right. We have improved health care attention three times. We have improved the statistics for birth rates. We have reduced child labor by half. You know we are an agricultural country. Just to give you an example, we have two million people living and working in our banana plantations. And many of them live there with their families. And the children used to work in those plantations. But because we are able to transform our educational system, and they don't have to pay for their schools, primary or secondary, they have left the labor force to go to study. So we reduced child labor by more than, by more than half. Primary education is nearly 100%. And all of this we've done by improving, improving the quality of education. Because one thing is to change the teachers, to change the infrastructure, to change the procedures. But 
at the end of the day, what's the <coughs> most important thing is that the students learn and have a quality education. And this is reflected in the exams we take from our students. And, and they have improved in language and math throughout the region. The second thing I wanted to mention is that we're the country that invest, invests the most in infrastructure in our region. The average is around 5%, 4 to 5%. We are able to invest 15% in infrastructure. But before going there, this is the statistics of how much we invest of our GDP in higher education. The OECD countries invest around 2% of their GDP. In Latin America, we invest 1.2%. Ecuador invests 2.2% of its GDP in higher education. It's the highest rate in our region and th something we are proud of. This is what I was telling you. The scholarships we had and the scholarships we have now. And if there are some Ecuadorians studying here, it's because of this. We created new universities of excellence, and one of them is called Yachay, because we decided to create a new city of knowledge in Ecuador where the best students will go, where the best labs will be, where our research institutes from the state will be relocated, where the students that are studying here in Australia and other parts of the world will go back to, to work and to study. We spent $1 billion in this project, and we have a technological park, IT park, an industrial park, and it's no longer a dream, it's a reality. It will take a long time to build a city, but if you go to Ecuador, you can visit it. All our teachers are PhDs from the best universities of the world. The other thing that we have done to, to improve the quality of life of our people is to reduce crime. We are now a single digit homicide rate in our region, which is 8.1%. In some other countries you have 20, 40 or more homicides per 100,000. It's the lowest in our history and one of the lowest in the region. And we were able to do it based on policy, but also based on, on improving how our security system works. When I was ambassador in China, uh, we, we started working with the different security institutions in Ecuador, the armed forces, the police, the firemen, the civil defense, the healthcare system, all of them worked separately, all of them. They didn't have the same communication system, they didn't have the same procedures, they lived in, in different worlds. Now, they're all connected because of this project. It didn't cost a lot of money, just $250 million. All our security system and institutions work together with software, with procedures, with protocols, with video cameras. And this is an example of one of those headquarters. We've been able to improve by 500% the efficiency of our courts with new buildings, with new 
IT procedures with online um, <clears throat> uh, procedures as well so that corruption is limited to a minimum. In other words, it takes now one-fifth of the time it used to take to have a lawsuit resolved. All of this we have done by having an average growth of 4.3%. It's not very high, but it's a bit higher than the average of Latin America. And you will ask, how, how are we able to do this in different and difficult circumstances? We did it by renegotiating our foreign debt, but also we did it by changing what we call uh, la cultura tributaria, the culture of tax payment, yes? When I entered the ministry nearly 30 years ago, the only ones that paid taxes in Ecuador were public employees, because it was discounted from our salary. Now in Ecuador, everyone pays taxes, everyone. So much so that in the last six to seven years, we have more than tripled our national income due to tax collection. In this graphic, you can see that from 2000 to 2006, our tax collection rate was $21 billion. In the same period of time, we were able to more than triple this by reducing tax rates by creating a tax culture, and by being more efficient in tax collection. The people that work in Ecuador's Internal Revenue Service are highly professional and very well paid. So now, as 30 years ago it was in our DNA not to pay taxes, now it's in our DNA to pay taxes. The other thing we have done, which has helped us a lot, is to improve the efficiency in public spending. In the past, only 7% of our budget was executed. That is, if a ministry received $100, at the end of the year it only spent 70. 70% 70 of the money they had. Now, because we changed our planning and our financial procedures, no ministry spends less than 95% of its budget. And they have the responsibility to spend each month 8.3% of the budget they have. This has allowed us to have more resources with more efficiency and we have done it in a very short period of time. I was telling you before that the average of public investment in Latin America is around 3.3 to 3.6 percent. In Ecuador, it's 11 percent, more than triple the average of Latin America. And this has allowed us to build 9,000 kilometers of new highways. It has allowed us to build at the same time 10 new projects that generate electricity <coughs> worth $5 billion. By improving the amount of money that is allocated for public investment, we were able to do a lot of the things I mentioned before. We have the lowest unemployment rate of Latin America. The best employment indicators, that is, the highest paid minimum, minimum wage salaries of our region. 
And we decided that our workers have to earn enough money to pay the minimum basket. That is, the minimum products you need to live. No company in Ecuador can declare a profit until all its workers have enough money to pay the what we call la canasta básica, the basic basket. For the first time in our history, our workers, all of them, earn enough money to pay their basic basket needs. No profit until all the workers live decently. The other thing we have done is that in Ecuador now, everyone is part of Social Security. 1.5 million people have entered Social Security that were outside of it. And we have done something else which is revolutionary. We have decided to include 1.5 million housewives in our Social Security services. Because if you're an economist, usually housewives are registered as something like unproductive labor or inactive labor. And if I tell my mother <laughs> or my sister that what they do is inactive labor, they will not like it because they work a lot to take care of us. So we decided that housewives will be included in Social Security and that we will help them financially to do so. The other thing we are doing is changing our productive matrix. Ecuador is doing well. We are no longer a middle-income country. We're now an upper-middle-income country. We have uh, political stability, legal security, an important economic growth, and a lot of uh, accomplishments. But basically, we're producing and exporting the same we always did. We have solved the problem of electricity by building 10 new projects. We will solve the problem of import of gasoline and diesel by building a huge new refinery worth $10 billion. But basically, we're producing and selling the same thing we always did. So we are decided to do two things. One is to invest in education, in science and technology. We have no ceiling in these type of spendings. That's why we have been able to do so much. And the second thing we have done is invested in the last eight years $25 billion in strategic projects in oil, mining, water, electricity, and telecommunications. <coughs> Yesterday and today we had meetings in New Zealand and Australia, and we presented a new portfolio of projects worth $25 billion. Among them, we have decided to build basic industries. That is, basic industries are the industries other industries are based on. The same industries that Japan and Korea decided to build. So we have earmarked $10 billion to build these new industries. In pe petrochemistry, pharmaceutical, copper refining, shipyards, siderurgica, metallurgica, and so on, $10 billion. 
it's very difficult to change the productive pattern of our history, to transform it, and to reach a new economic and productive structure. But we're doing it. All of this has allowed us to improve our competitiveness in 30 points, in 30 places, from 100 to 70, in only eight years. A, a Colombian uh, magazine published an article called The Ecuadorian Miracle. Ecuadorian Miracle. How is it that a country is able to improve 30 places in eight years its competitiveness? No me acuerdo el nombre. It's a manacle. And uh, sometimes the institutes that do these type of polls cannot believe the changes that have taken place and ex decide to exclude Ecuador from the list until they verify that the information that is there is true. So Ecuador has become a very competitive country. And still we maintain, as most of the countries in South and Latin America, it's a very beautiful country. You know, in, we are a bio mega diverse country. There are only 14 of us, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Basically because, and this is a very simple explanation, during the ice age, the equator didn't freeze. So the flora and fauna was able to survive, and we have an impressive biodiversity. In one hectare of our Amazon basin, one hectare, you have more varieties of birds than all of Europe. In one hectare of our Amazon basin, you have more varieties of trees than in all of North America, Canada, US, and Mexico combined, in one hectare. So we are a very attractive country for tourism. It's the best place to retire. <laughs> it is. We don't say it, the, the specialized magazines say it. So we were able to double the tourists that visit Ecuador in the last six and seven years. It's still only the fourth income of our economy, only 100,000 people working it, and the revenue is around $1 billion, but it has a lot of potential. <clears throat> And, and these are the electricity projects I mentioned, 10 at the same time, which will allow us to double our electricity output. And right now, today, 43% of our electricity is hydro. The rest is thermoelectric, fueled by diesel and, and by, by refined crude oil. In two years, 95% of our electricity will be hydro. Cheap and clean electricity. We will double our electricity output with this investment in $5 billion. So we don't have to import, as we have done in the last years, worth $1 billion electricity from Colombia and Peru. And this is money you spend and never see again. I remember once I was sitting with the head of the, the institution of Ecuador signing a check for $180 million to Colombia because we had to pay our electricity bills. It's money you spend and never see again. Now we spend the money in these projects. And the other thing we've done is we're building a refinery 
Each year, Ecuador exports $12 billion of crude oil. It's a lot of money. But we import $6.3 billion in diesel and gasoline. $6.3 billion. It's money you spent and never see again. So we decided to build a refinery worth $10 billion, which will allow us in three to four years to comply with our national demand. In other words, in four years, we will not spend one cent importing refined crude oil. So that money, instead of being spent abroad, will stay in our country. The other thing we've done is that, as is the case in, in most countries, we have regions where it's very dry, but in one part of the year we have a flooding, you don't have irrigation, and you don't have potable water. And this has a high effect on production. So we decided to build 16, 16 projects, what we call multipropósito, that fix this. We will have dams to control the flooding, we will have irrigation, and we will have potable water for the communities. We are spending $1 billion right now in these projects, six of them, and we will do 10 more. This has a high impact on production and productivity and on the welfare of our people. I'm nearly finishing, nearly finishing. E-government. One of the things we have done is every public employee in Ecuador has to do his homework. Everyone has goals and indicators. I do, our ambassador does, and the messenger of my office has. Everyone, from the minister to the lowest ranking employee. And you have to show at the end of the year what you're doing. If you're an ambassador, you have to improve foreign trade, foreign investment, scholarships, and so on. If you don't comply with those objectives, you will no longer have that job. But if you do comply with them, and you do it well, you will have a financial incentive. You will earn more than you usually do. And the results have been tremendous. And we have done this by tripling, as I said, access to internet. But yet, we have many challenges ahead. Still, one out of five Ecuadorians is poor. We still have a very basic industry. We only export commodities to the industrialized world. Oil, roses, coffee, banana, shrimp, cocoa. And only sell manufactured goods to our neighbors. We sell $700 million in cars to our neighbors. 30% of Peru's refrigerators and washing machines are, come from Ecuador. But we have a huge challenge in that. So this is basically what I wanted to tell you. Transformation in our educational system, science and technology. Transformation in our productive sector. Yes. 
efficiency in our government, complete transparency in everything we do. And, and I give you examples. In the past, each ministry had to build what it had to build. The Ministry of Education had to build schools. The Ministry of Health had to build hospitals. Now we have a state institution that builds all the buildings that have to be built so that the Minister of Education can deal with what he has knowledge of, education. And the Minister of Health deals with the problems of the health sector, not with the structure and architecture engineering of the building. We are building now 3,500 new structures like this with a company, with professionals. The other thing we have done, just to show how efficiency can be done and improved by public policy. In the past, all the medicines were bought by the, many, by the hospital of the armed forces, by the hospital of the police, by the hospitals of the Ministry of Health, by the hospitals of Social Security. We import each year $1.5 billion in medicine. $1.5 billion. So now what we do is we buy all the medicines of all the hospitals through one company. And this has reduced the cost of medicines tremendously. But it has had many problems because when you change things, you will confront many interests and many people who will oppose it because they will lose their business. The people that import $6 billion of crude, refined crude oil to Ecuador will find excuses why we should not build our refinery. Those who earn money from importing electricity will do the same. Those who pay and earn a lot of money importing medicines will oppose this new type of structure. But we're doing it. And at the end of the day, what happens is that you govern for the common good and you're able to change the quality of life of our people. So this is what I wanted to share with you. From a small country far away, Ecuador, many people don't know where it is, <laughs> how we look like, what language we speak. Some people think we're in Africa. <laughs> they confuse us with Equatorial Guinea. But we're doing this uh, with a, a lot of conviction, um, with a lot of leadership, and also with a lot of efficiency. Thank you for your patience.